those who haven't met, I'm Frank Doyle, the 14th Provost here at Brown. Pleasure to meet a lot of new faces out there, so great to see you all here today. And I want to thank you for attending today to hear the discussion about Elemental, How Five Elements Changed Earth's Past and Will Shape Our Future, as you see on the slide. Um, I want to start by thanking the Staff Advisory Council for partnering with my office to springboard this reading series for staff members. I've been so pleased to see the interest and the enthusiasm from our staff, so I'm delighted there. And also, I want to thank um, all of the staff across the university, day in, day out, the amazing things you do. And goodness knows, this semester has been a little bit unusual with many of the things that we're all confronting and dealing with. So even more appreciative of the important role of all of you in helping us navigate the turbulent waters that we're going through right now. Um, finding time to talk about a book like this is really a bright spot in that otherwise uh, chaotic week. Um, really hope that you uh, did, like I did, found the time to dive into this uh, amazing book and really get the most out of it. Um, as you know, this book um, by our colleague Stephen Porter takes readers from the deep geologic past to our current era of human dominance by focusing on these five elements that are captured at least their um, uh, chemistry abbreviations in the, the green boxes on the title here. Hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Um, showing how these elements underpin the success of human civilization and how their mismanagement threatens catastrophic unintended consequences. Uh, Stephen argues if we can learn from our world-changing predecessors, like the simple cyanobacteria, we can construct a more sustainable future. Um, a little bit about our speaker. So Stephen Porter is the Acacia Professor of Ecology, Evolutionary and Organismal Biology and Environment and Society at Brown. A very long and fitting title where he serves as Associate Provost for Sustainability, something I'm um, pleased and delighted and privileged to be able to enjoy that partnership. His basic research focuses on nutrient and carbon cycling in tropical rainforests, the implications, both biophysical and societal, of industrial agriculture in the tropics and the potential for large-scale tropical forest restoration. Recently, he's been working more closely at the intersection of science and institutional solutions to climate change. He's the founder and science lead on the radio show podcast, Possibly, which explores everyday issues related to sustainability and airs on public radio stations around the country. And of course, the author of the book today, which we're going to discuss. He has uh, over 70 peer-reviewed publications and, and authored recent articles in the New York Times as well as Time Magazine. Uh, for those of you who've read the book, you know there's a biographical undercurrent in places where he talks about his training, but if you hadn't picked up on that, his BA is uh, in history from Amherst College, uh, his master's in geology from the University of Montana, and his PhD in biology from Stanford University. Um, shortly after his PhD, he joined Brown in 2007 on our faculty. Uh, in 2018, uh, Stephen was named the first Associate Provost for Sustainability in the nation. He is currently working to lead Brown's transition off fossil fuels and towards a more sustainable campus and community. And I want to give you just sort of a glimpse into some of the amazing things he's working on in that capacity. So as part of our pledge to reduce campus greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2040, Brown's exploring the feasibility of using geothermal energy as the primary source of heat for the buildings in both College Hill and the Jewelry District neighborhoods. So you may have seen around the campus, there are little mini construction sites where Brown's Office of Sustainability and Resiliency, as well as Facilities Management, drilled about 1,000 feet into the ground at three different locations uh, to test sites and determine the feasibility, really the thermodynamic efficiency of using the geothermal heating and cooling across the campus. Uh, this effort marks the deepest holes ever drilled on the campus and will show us how many wells and to what depth we need to um, invest and drill to move away from fossil fuel combustion to a highly efficient geothermal system. This is incredibly exciting work led by Stephen, and I look forward to um, his reflections more broadly on the uh, topic up on the screen here. Uh, after Stephen shares his remarks, gives his lecture, we'll have a chance for Q&A. So think of questions and, and be ready at the end of the talk here. And uh, Stephen, if you don't get hands up, there is something called the cold call technique that, uh, <laughs> yeah, take advantage. So colleagues, please welcome Stephen Porter. Thanks so much, uh, Frank, for for 
Intro for the introduction and for, for inviting me to do this, I'm super honored to have the provost force you all to buy my book. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, well, from my perspective, it's the same, yeah. So, <laughs> um, and it's really wonderful to see a lot of familiar faces. I don't know everyone in the room, but as I look around, I see, I see a lot of people I know, which is really, it's really great that you took the time out of your day, and I'm, I'm flattered that, that you came to, to, to this, so it's really great. Um, I, I brought a talk that I give on, this, on the book that's loosely based, it really is based on the book. So if you haven't read it, don't worry, we'll cover all the interesting points. And if you have read it, uh, I hope that this will sort of crystallize you, for you some of the ways that I've come to think of it after writing it. So I've never, I've never written a book before. In science, um, one writes papers, mostly not books. And the, I thought when I finished the book that I had said what I wanted to say. But as I've had to talk about it more and more, uh, I realized that there, there are more things about it that, that I wish I had said, not that I'm going to go back and rewrite it. Um, and so this talk is really a representation of that, of, this idea, of the ideas that have emerged as I've been forced to crystallize and put in talks. There are a lot of slides, so if you want to swing around so that you can see them, you can. Uh, otherwise, you can see? Okay. All good. Okay. Okay. So when one gets tenure, one can start to pontificate about just about anything. <laughs> Um, which is the great thing about being faculty. And so I thought I would start off the talk in, uh, uh, with the three big questions that I think that this book addresses. And so the first one is, what is life? Now, that's a very big question. And I want to explain to you in a minute why I ask it and what my answer for this talk is. But you can think about it as I go on. Uh, the, the next question, which is directly related to the book, is, how is it that living things actually go about changing the world? How does that happen? And, and, uh, and what, what can we learn from that? And then the last one is, what is sustainability? Now, I hope you'll agree that these are three really big questions to ask. I obviously don't have all or even close to all the answers. But I think framing them together in the book and in, and in, thinking, about, um, in thinking about my work and my career, uh, they, they, they make a consistent story, these, these three questions, even though they seem like they're, from, they're very different. So let's start with this question of what is life? Life is obviously, uh, what is life is a profoundly spiritual and religious, societal, all sorts of questions. Um, but as a biologist, biologists tend to think about life uh, as the organisms we can see around us. And so I chose to illustrate this question, this picture of myself and my daughter Phoebe in the Amazon uh, on a field course. She'd be embarrassed now because she's 18 and would t <laughs> totally be, but so don't tell her. Um, but I picked, the, I picked this uh, because if you, if you read about the Amazon rainforest, you often hear it described as teeming with life, right? It's just overabundance of life. And in fact, there are more tree species in an acre of the Amazon than there are in all of North America. So huge diversity of life. And in this picture, you see some, oh, you can't see the pointer on the camera, but uh, on the screen, but you see two vertebrates in the middle, right? <laughs> uh, you see a whole host of plants that I can't identify because I'm a lousy botanist. And you see a fun, uh, some fungi in the front that are actually being farmed by the ants beneath our feet. So these are fungi that are being farmed by the ants. So there's enormous diversity of life in this picture. And biologists like to think of life, right? All life as being, uh, we know it's, all, it's descended from a common ancestor. And so you could ask the question, OK, in this picture of all this amazing life in the Amazon, how does that map onto the tree of all life, the three major groups, the uh, archaea, the bacteria, uh, and the eukaryotes? And if you do that, uh, and you map onto that tree of life, all the life you can see in the photo, it's all in that little red circle. That's how diverse the world is, right? All, everything you can see in the Amazon is just one teeny little piece of the tree of life. So, I, look, I got a PhD in biology, but before that, my first biology class was in, my last biology class was in ninth grade. So I can't possibly wrap my head around the tree of life. And so I needed something as a simplifying thing to think about what is life. And if you look at all of the things in that red circle and you analyze their chemistry, and hence we get to the elemental part of the story, all of the living things in that tree of life on, under that circle have basically the same chemistry, mostly hydrogen, about half as much oxygen as hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, in that order and in that rough abundance. Well, you say, look, there's a huge other part of the tree of life. What about that? 
So let's take a look over here at the cyanobacteria, which if you've read the book, you know forms some part of the, tree, uh, of the story. And if you analyze their chemistry, and they look like this under the microscope, so very different than anything that you can uh, see in the picture, their chemistry is the same. Right? It's basically the same. And so for the purposes of this book, the idea uh, or the, the answer to the question, what is life, is really life consists of organisms that are forced to gather these elements from their environment from the rock that they sit on, from the water that they float in, from the air that they breathe. Somehow, they have to gather this chemistry from their surroundings. And as far as we know, there is no way to have anything alive without these elements in this order <laughs> constructed from the environment. So that's what is life. Uh, the book is largely, at least the first part of the book, it tells the story of uh, how living things can change the world. So let's jump into that a little bit. And the main idea that really emerges from the book and I want to talk about today is that when organisms evolve a new way, a better way, a more efficient way to gather these elements from their environment, it's then that they can change the world. So I want you to hold that idea in your head while we walk through why that's so. When I was growing up or when I heard, you know, whenever you hear this thing like Earth, Earth is the living planet, right? Earth is a living planet. I always thought of that as meaning that Earth hosted us, hosted living things, right? Um, but Earth is not just home to living things. Earth itself is shaped by living things. Actually, when we look for life on other planets, we look for the chemical signature of life. We're not looking for the organisms themselves. We're looking for the pl a planet that is shaped by life. And Earth is shaped by life. And this relates back to how organisms can change the world. But in order to explain why, I need to stay with me for a few more slides. So our planet hosts life because it has liquid water. And the first two elements in all living things are hydrogen and oxygen. Why do we have living wa uh, liquid water? We have liquid water because we have gases in our atmosphere that keep the planet warm. If we did not have these gases in the atmosphere, the oceans would be frozen solid. The planet would be cold. It's warm because these gases help trap heat that would otherwise escape from Earth. See, I told you. <laughs> and interestingly, if you look at, the, if, if you look at these uh, gases, um, you'll note that they're made of the same atoms, the same elements that life is. So if you look at those gases and you look at me and Phoebe, right? carbon dioxide, CO2, methane, CH4, nitrous oxide, N2O, water vapor, H2O, that's the same stuff Phoebe and I are made of. We'll come back to phosphorus in a little while. It's my favorite, but I'm going to save, I'm going to save it for later. Okay. So these are the elements that connect living things to, to our planet. And so the book tells the story of three examples of this main idea. And if you already forgot the main idea, the main idea is that organisms that evolve more efficient ways to gather these elements can change the world. And you can already see that connection, right? Because the gases that keep the planet warm are the same elements that we need to gather from our environment, right? And so you can change the amount of gases in the atmosphere if you pull more of those elements into your body or affect the flows of those elements around the planet. So the book tells three stories, and I'm going to tell you three stories today. I'm going to Ground, these, uh, ground this story in this diagram. This is, you read this diagram like a clock. It's a history of Earth. Earth has been around for about 4.6 billion years. So if you start at noon and go clockwise, right, you're going forward in time. And I'm going to tell three stories. The first story is a bacter bacterial story that took place about 2.5 to 3 billion years ago, so about 4 PM on this clock. right? <laughs> The second story is when plants evolved and moved onto land, somewhere at about 1030, uh, but four, 400 million years ago, which sounds like a really long time, but when you're looking at this clock, you realize just how old the Earth is. Um, and then, of course, the last is of humans. So let's dive in and tell the first story. Now, as, as Frank mentioned, I was a history major as an undergrad. So I'm, I got re I, and one of the classes I took as an undergrad was called the history of science. So I've always been fascinated by the history of science. And so I really love this example um, because it's both a historical and scientific example. And the reason I tell this story is because 
the story of bacteria two and a half billion years ago, which in the book I call the biggest environmental change of all time, and it certainly was, is a story about the nature of the atmosphere on our planet. Now, for a long time, humans didn't know a lot about the nature of the atmosphere on our planet. But in, 17, in the 1770s, a theologian chemist named Joseph Priestley did a series of really cool experiments that he titled Experiments and Observations on Different Kinds of Air. He lived next to a brewery that smelled really bad. And he was curious as to why different air sort of had different qualities. Um, he also went around sniffing roast, uh, rotting mutton at different stages to, to, to try and tell what the putrid air, you know, he was very, scientists are very dedicated. Um, but this experiment didn't involve rotted, mut, rotted, rotting mutton, um, which is something I haven't said very often. Um, it involved a bell jar, a, a sealed bell jar. And in that jar, he placed a candle. And he noticed that the candle in, inevitably couldn't maintain a flame for very long if it was in a sealed jar. And he thought, huh. I wonder why that is. And he tried the same experiment with the mouse. And he noticed that that, too, uh, invariably snuffed out. And then he had this brilliant idea. And he put a sprig of mint in with the mouse and with the candle. And his observation was that he found that not, the air would neither extinguish the candle nor was it at all inconvenient <laughs> to the mouse. Right? And from that, he made an unbelievable conclusion an amazing, I don't mean unbelievable in the untrue sense, I mean amazing, uh, that air is not an unalterable thing. And he actually went on to posit that with all of the fires in the world and all of the animals breathing in and out all the time, if there wasn't something restoring the fresh air, we would have all long since suffocated. And he even posited that plants were what was, that plants exercising all their powers is how he described it, that plants were the thing that were doing that. It took another 200 years from the 1770s before these two Harvard professors, uh, Preston Cloud and Dick Holland, really began to understand just how much air could be changed by life. And they taught us uh, about, or they were the first ones to really understand the biggest environmental change of all time. So in order to understand that change, instead of going back 200 years to Priestley, I'm going to go all the way back to 2.5 billion years ago and talk about what the planet was like then. So the air on this very early Earth was, as it is today, made mostly of the element nitrogen, but in an in inert form. So you and I are breathing in 80% nitrogen with every breath. It comes into our lungs. It goes right back out in exactly the same chemical form, which is two nitrogen atoms stuck to each other so tightly that we can't break them apart. It's not usable. But all of our bodies, as you saw from the formula in the what is life section of this talk, have a lot of nitrogen in them. So we have to somehow break that bond in order to use that nitrogen and build our amino acids and our proteins. There was no oxygen at all in the air. You and I would have suffocated just like the mouse in the bell jar. And the planet was kept warm not by carbon dioxide mostly as it is today, but by another greenhouse gas, methane. Um, and that's very good because the sun was quite weak at the, was weaker at this time. And so without this very potent greenhouse gas in the air at high concentrations, the planet would be frozen. And the thing I want you to hold in your mind for this piece of the story is that methane doesn't play well with oxygen. And in fact, you know this because if you have natural gas at your house, uh, that's what natural gas is methane, and it burns in the presence of oxygen. So what about life on early Earth? Well, all life was in the ocean and single-celled. And if you live in the ocean, it's really easy to get hydrogen and oxygen because water is all around you. But Carbon was a harder story because early photosynthesis, which had evolved probably even longer ago, probably three and a half billion years ago, maybe even a little more, early photosynthesis was very inefficient. So what I mean by inefficient is you had needed a lot of sunlight to get just a little bit of carbon out of that photosynthesis. And the equation, and I promise there's not too many chemical equations in this, but I think this one might have been in the book as well. Um, so the, 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 the chemistry of this is that um, photosynthesis took carbon dioxide, uh, and hydrogen sulfide and use the energy of sunlight to make organic molecules. So, so the sugars and starches and other carbohydrates and all, all that stuff that's in, our, in plant bodies that we eat, and then deposited out elemental sulfur. So early photosynthesis was inefficient because it was based on sulfur. And we also think that there was very little nitrogen around. So the big constraints to life on Earth at this time were how do you get carbon and how do you get nitrogen? That's what was constraining the amount of life. 
And cyanobacteria, the first world-changing organisms, evolved, put together two fundamental biochemical mechanisms to overcome these constraints. The first, sorry about the dark uh, S in this, in this equation, the first was to combine a new form of photosynthesis that worked a little bit differently. So instead of carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide and sunlight making organic material, it became carbon dioxide and water and sunlight. And instead of making, uh, to make organic material. And of course, there's way more water in the ocean than there is anything else. So that's good. And also, this process is more efficient. That is, for a given amount of light, it just gives you more organic material. You can build more cells. They also then figured out or co-opted a biological process called nitrogen fixation that allowed them to pull nitrogen, the N2 that we breathe in and out without changing it, to break that apart into ammonia, which is the usable form of nitrogen from which we build all the proteins in our bodies, for example. Combining these two allowed them, remember they have hydrogen and they have oxygen because they live in the ocean. Now they can get carbon because they have this efficient photosynthesis, and then they can get nitrogen, which is the key uh, component of the machinery that helps them get more carbon. right? So they've overcome these constraints, these elemental constraints, to their, to their abundance. And they begin to wildly proliferate. So all of a sudden, you get this explosion of life on Earth. Probably 10 to 100 times more life on Earth arises because of this evolutionary innovation. That's great. They're living it. They're living the life, right? They take over the planet. But by accident, they cause air pollution. They don't want to cause air pollution. They just want to build more and more and more and more. But every time they do, they spill more and more oxygen into the atmosphere. Well, first into the ocean. And then that begins to bubble into the atmosphere. And when that happens, and remember I asked you to remember, oxygen reacts with methane. And so by accident, this oxygen bubbles into the atmosphere, destroys the methane that is keeping the planet warm, and plunges the Earth into the first ice age, the first global ice age. right? So it's an environmental catastrophe. You have an entire world full of single-celled organisms that live in an environment with no oxygen. And they've been that way for almost a billion and a half years. No oxygen around. And then all of a sudden, over a couple hundred million years, all of a sudden, right, they're faced with a new challenge, which is oxygen in the air and a frozen planet. So the cyanobacteria become the first organisms to create a global glaciation. The tree of life, the life must, life did collapse, right? You cannot have, it didn't disappear, obviously. We're all here. But life did collapse. And it changed the tree of life forever in ways that we will never know, because there's not really a fossil record from this time. And the reason for this is what I really want you to take from this first story, which is environmental catastrophe followed this, this pattern of evolutionary innovation to gather all these elements from their environment proliferation through that success, and then an accidental environmental consequence as a result of that success. So that brings us through the bacterial story and to the plants. Now, um, when plants evolved on, onto land, when plants made their way out of the ocean onto land um, about 400 million years ago, they inhabited a planet that was much more similar to what we live in today than the cyanobacteria story of old. But there were a few differences. One, there, it was very, very, very warm. And it was warm because there was a lot of CO2 in the air at the time. You could have swum in a bathing suit at the North Pole without a wetsuit and been fine. Okay? Another slight difference you might notice in the map is that the continents weren't exactly where they are today. Right? But there was a lot of land. So you had a pan-tropical world kept warm by CO2. And plants move out across the continent under these very rich, uh, 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 these very warm and CO2 rich conditions. So if you think about it from an elemental perspective, what's the challenge to life on land? The challenge to life on land is staying hydrated. If you live in the ocean, no problem. If you're on land, especially if you can't move, like what do you do when it doesn't rain or if the soil is dry? Right? How do you get your water? And so plants evolved. A, a, the colonization of land was facilitated by three key evolutionary in innovations that happened that had to do with water. I'm only going to talk about two here. The first is the evolution of really complex root structures 
This is a 380 million year old fossilized plant and you can see the roots structures in that fossil. They look just like plants today. And roots, of course, allow plants to explore the soil and gather, and gather water. If you look at a microscope image of those plants, you'll find that they are colonized by the same kinds of fungi that colonize plant roots today. And fungi are extremely good at ex exploring every nook and cranny and provide a huge amount of water to plants even today. About 80% of all land plants have fungal partners. It's almost not right to talk about plants as a thing. They are, they are tied to fungi intimately all over the world. So they evolve a way to stay hydrated. They solve the hydrogen and oxygen problem on land through these evolutionary innovations. And so what are their advantages? Well, now all of a sudden they can spread across continents that have nothing else. There's all this sunlight, 30% of the Earth's surface, hitting all that energy hitting the Earth's surface. They can start to capture that new source of energy. Nobody has captured that energy before. Once they begin to tap into this energy source, they need the other elements right, to build their bodies. And they have an, another enormous advantage over the cyanobacteria and other, anything in the ocean with regards to phosphorus. I haven't talked anything about phosphorus, but I did tell you it was my favorite. Um, phosphorus is not really dissolvable in water, and it doesn't have a gas phase, so it's not in the air. But it is abundant in rocks. If you're a cyanobacteria floating in the ocean, in the middle of the Pacific, for example, where can you get rocks? There's nothing near you. There's, you're at the surface, rocks are at the bottom. They're on the continents, you're in the middle of the Pacific. You are dependent on a slow trickle of dust or maybe rivers to bring phosphorus into the oceans. But plants go right to the source. And because they have roots and fungi, they become the world's best miners. They are, in fact, still the world's best miners. If you walk down a sidewalk, you see plants breaking that sidewalk apart everywhere. Right? You can't, these buildings, if we stopped inhabiting these buildings, the plants would colonize and break them apart. No problem. Right? It might take a little while, but no problem. So because they uh, had these in innovations geared towards water, they were also able to, to get phosphorus. And so that allowed them to spread, the first tropical forest to spread all across the continents. They became wildly successful. And of course, eventually they pulled enough CO2 out of the air through incorporation in their tissues and other changes to the Earth's chemistry that they began to cool the planet. Remember I said the planet was very warm because there was so much CO2 in the air? Now plants have evolved the capacity to explode their population, to increase their population so dramatically that they pull enough CO2 out of the air that they actually end the pantropical period uh, that they e evolved into. They, provide, they create a global glaciation. Pantropical ecosystems collapse. It's actually one of the six mass extinctions that we talk about in the fossil record because there's enough organisms around at this time that we have a fossil record from this time. They changed the tree of life forever, setting the stage for the rise of the dinosaurs, for example, which are not a very big, important, world-changing organism, even though they're very cool. Um, and they did it in exactly the same way, sort of conceptually, as the, as the cyanobacteria. They innovated, they proliferated, and by accident, changed the atmosphere. So that brings us to our third world-changing organism, which is, of course, us. I'll start with the fact I said I wasn't going to have lunch because I was going to have salad in my teeth, and now I have salad in my teeth. Anyway, uh, humans are wildly prolif proliferating. If you need any proof of that, uh, I'll give you this graph. This shows you human population over the last 10,000 years. If that's not proliferation, I don't know what is. <laughs> uh, I was born at just over 4 billion. We're now or, or just under 4 billion. Uh-oh. Um, and we're now uh, at about 8.5 and, and going to 10 almost certainly by the middle of this century after which it will probably plateau. So why are we so successful? Well, we're so successful for exactly the same reason as the previous world-changing organisms. We needed access to water. It's the first key to life on land. We learned that from the plants. We store three times more water in reservoirs than are combined in all the world's rivers. We have dug up, literally dug up, the bodies of our world-changing predecessors. The end of the plant era, was, of the first plant tropical forest era, is called the Carboniferous. It's called the Carboniferous because that's where our coal comes from. We dug up that old, the, that old buried photosynthetic energy that those plants stored, and we started burning it for our own purposes. 
And uh, we became the first multicellular organism in the history of life on Earth, in four billion year history of life on Earth, to be able to break that dinitrogen bond and turn, make our own ammonia. No other multicellular organism can do that. We're kind of smart in a stupid kind of way. Uh, <laughs> and we use all of that energy uh, to mine more phosphorus out of deposits, mostly in Morocco, but scattered around the rest of the world. Uh, uh, we pull more phosphorus out of rock than all other natural processes combined across all the continents. So we have radically increased our access to all of life's essential elements. So it's no surprise that we're able to proliferate. And of course, it's also in this context no surprise that we have unintended consequences. We're mining groundwater faster than, can, than it can be replenished. The world is rapidly warming in response to our carbon emissions. Uh, and we, our nitrogen and phosphorus overuse is causing massive environmental consequences when it escapes from our farms and escapes in the broadest sense. So I want to give you just a couple of examples, and then I want to move to the happy part of the talk. I promised myself I was going to show this video at every talk I give. I don't, uh, many of you have seen it, so forgive me for that. But for those of you who haven't, I'll just walk you through what it is. I want you to take this to your holiday conversation. <laughs> this is a map of the world. It's color-coded by the temperature of a particular place. In this case, in, during the time in the middle 1880s, relative to the temperature of that place in the middle of the 20th century. So for example, take a look at West Africa, which is right in the middle of the map. It's bright red. That means that in the period 1880 to 1884, West Africa was about one degree Celsius warmer than West Africa was in the middle of the 20th century. It was having a warm five years. If you look at North America in contrast, or at least Western North America, shown in blue, that Western North America during 1880 to 1884 was cold relative to the way Western North America was in the middle of the 20th century. So if everybody's sort of keyed into the color map, you get to watch a video now going forward in time into the 1890s and 1910s, 20s. See if you can see a change. Oh, wait, it didn't. The video must be broken. See if you can see a change. For those people who go home to the holidays and get a relative telling them that the world is not warming, I'm happy to share this video. <laughs> okay. So these are average temperatures. And of course, anybody can see that we are warming the planet. And I could give any number of lectures on how we know that this is directly tied to our emissions. I want to say one more thing because it relates to how we experience this change. When you walk outside and it's 70 degrees, 2 degrees warmer at 72 degrees makes no difference to you. What matters to you is extremes, right? if it's really hot. And the New York Times had this great graphic a couple of months, about a month ago now, where they plotted the temperatures of the northern hemisphere in a histogram. And so this is summer temperature in the northern hemisphere in the time period 1951 to 1980. And we just saw a map showing that everything is warming up. So you should expect that peak to shift to the left over time. But it's not just, I don't want you to watch the peak. I want you to watch the edge. Okay, so here we go. We're, this is the average. The, this is the summer temperature for the northern hemisphere in 1951 to 1980, 1980 to 1990, 1991 to 2000, 2000 to 2012, and up to the present. It is not the shift in the peak that matters. A couple of degrees doesn't matter, but when you shift the peak you change the frequency of the extremes in a really big way. And it's those extreme heats, those extreme rains, those extreme droughts, those extremes in general that are what make the difference for life on Earth. Right? We don't respond to the average. So it's easy to be like, oh, two degrees Celsius, one and a half degrees Celsius. Like, why, is the IP, why are people all <coughs> worked up about this? Right? It, that's why we're worked up about this. OK. And I'll just say one more depressing thing before I give you the, the good stuff. Um, nitrogen and phosphorus overuse on farms is a, is a big problem. Uh, and just to point that out, here is a map of the world showing you where we grow crops in green. And all those dots along the coasts are places that are so polluted by nitrogen and phosphorus that you have big algal blooms that are actually like poisoning the water, essentially, and leading fish kills and all this sort of thing. 
So they're nearly permanent downstream from all agriculture because of our overuse of fertilizer. Okay, and all sorts of other bad things happen, but I don't want to, I, I don't want to talk for too long. The problem with nitrogen and phosphorus is that we're hooked on it. We have eight billion people in the world. We could only feed half of them without nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizer. So we need to keep using it, but we need to figure out a way to avoid the environmental consequences of overusing it. That's the problem with nitrogen and phosphorus. OK. So that leads me to the last bit of the talk about what is sustainability. Because I think that now that we understand how it is that organisms change the world, we can begin to think about how one must behave in order to build a more sustainable future. So I asked GP, ChatGPT. <laughs> so ChatGPT says, sustainability involves meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs, balancing environmental, social, and economic factors for long-term well-being. It's about responsibly managing resources and ecosystems to ensure a harmonious and enduring relationship between humans and the environment. It's embarrassingly close to what every university would write in a sustainability plan, I have to say. <laughs> but I actually think it's sort of, like all things ChatGPT says, sort of vacuous and imprecise, right? So let's talk, let me posit for you that what I think now is the central premise of the third part of the book and what I've learned, what I think is really what the book should have been about from the very beginning, which is that sustainability really starts with wise management of life's essential elements. And let me talk about a few examples. One example is carbon. We have an incredible good fortune relative to our world-changing predecessors because the vast majority of our carbon use is for energy outside our bodies. Eight billion humans don't require very much energy to run us. We require a lot of energy to run our lights and our airplanes and our furnaces and whatever. And so one question is, can we get the energy we want without the emissions that we don't want? We don't want to accidentally change the world like our world-changing predecessors. So I'll give you an example at the very local level from my house on the east side. Uh, this is my house circa 2007 when I moved in. Uh, and our neighbor's car, which runs on gas. I didn't take a picture of our gas car because I didn't know I was going to give this talk at the time. So if you break down our energy use in this house, when in, in the, let's say, mid-2010, uh, we used about 866 gallons of oil a year to heat our house. We used 600 gallons of gas a year to drive our car. We used some electricity to run our fridge and our dryer. Probably sounds a lot like your house. We spent about $6,700 a year on that service, and we emitted 15 tons of CO2 from that house. Now, we wanted a warm house. That's why we burned oil. We wanted to get around. That's why we burned gas. We wanted to run a fridge. That's why we used electricity. We didn't particularly want to spend the money, but we were willing to, and we certainly had no interest in emitting any CO2. That was not the goal. That was the accidental byproduct of our experience. Well, it turns out you don't need to do that. We renovated our house, we put in insulation, we switched to all electric heat pumps, we got rid of the oil furnace, we got rid of the car, gas car, got an electric car. So now what does the house look like? Zero gallons of oil a year, zero gallons of gas a year. As a result, we use way more electricity because we need to replace the services that the oil and gas were providing with, with electricity. Costs us about half as much, and our emissions drop to three. For those of you who didn't bring your calculator, that's an 80% decrease. And of course, everyone's like, well, where are your solar panels? Well, we just put those on. So now we're at net zero. Okay. So what do we have? We have a more comfortable house. We have a car that works better. We pay less. And we have avoided the, the externality, the, the environmental side effect that our cyanobacterial and plant predecessors couldn't do. We figured out how to do that by, by, by good fortune, really. Brown is doing the same thing. So Frank mentioned this at the beginning. We emit not 15 metric tons of carbon dioxide, but 50,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide a year. And what you're seeing in red is how much we have emitted. And what you see in the black dotted line is where we're going. So we have 240 acres of solar panels in southern Rhode Island that are right now, at least temporarily, but hopefully permanently, pumping electricity into the grid. Uh, we are in the midst of renovating the campus and doing essentially the exact same thing that I did to my house for the campus, right? And we will get there by 2040. This will be an incredible achievement. 
If you think beyond the university, we're actually also working with the state. So Rhode Island emits not 50,000 metric tons per year, but 11 million metric tons. And they, by law, we have said by law that we're going to be at zero by 2050. But guess what? 80% of Rhode Island's emissions come from the same things we've been talking about, transportation, uh, heating. Um, so this is doable. And Brown is working to help Rhode Island do this. Right? And to think about how the lessons we learned here by going first can be taken outside the campus and help decarbonize the rest of the state. And then I'll give you one more example uh, for nitrogen and phosphorus, and then I'll take questions. So the question here is, can we get the food that we need without the environmental consequences that we don't want? Brown is working really hard to reduce our nutrient pollution. It's a central tenet of our sustainability plan. And the key here, and I was very happy to see that there's no red meat being served, because the key here is to reduce red meat consumption. So about 85% of Brown's nitrogen footprint comes through food, and most of that comes through red meat. And so we have a goal of reducing red meat consumption on campus by 50% by 2030 in order to get the food, high quality food and nutrition that we need without the environmental consequences that we don't want. That's a local example. I want to give one example of my colleague Lisa Schulte Moore at Iowa State working at the regional because it's so cool. And she won a MacArthur, so I feel like I have to talk about it. Um, so Lisa is working in a corn soybean agriculture in the middle of the Midwest, the most productive agricultural system in the world. And what she's doing is working with farmers to incorporate these what are so-called prairie strips into those farms. So these are the pretty uh, curvy stripes in this soybean field. Why does she do that? She does that because uh, although soybeans are very productive and corn is very productive, corn is very productive it run, the fertilizer runs off into the water and causes all these horrible consequences. And if you plant prairie strips, you vastly reduce the environmental consequences of agriculture without reducing the amount of food very much. Here's another picture. And just to give you a sense, when you plant prairie strips on 10% of these highly industrialized farms, you reduce soil loss by 95%. You retain 70 plus percent of the nitrogen and phosphorus that would otherwise be lost in all forms. And you actually start to rebuild soil carbon, which farmers love. If you look, a picture is worth a thousand words. On the left is what the water coming out of a soy field, a corn field looks like. You can see the mud flowing through that white flume. In the middle, it's still 90 percent corn, only 10 percent prairie. But look how much cleaner that water is coming out. And it looks almost as good as 100% prairie. So this is not a solution, but it is a big piece of a solution. And this is spreading like wildfire across the Midwest. Lisa can't keep up with planting. It's now in 14 states, over 180,000 acres. It's in the Conservation Reserve Program, which is funded through the Farm Bill. This is a big deal. It's going to change Midwestern agriculture in a big way. And it's going to allow us to continue to produce the food that we need without the environmental consequences that we don't want. So to wrap up, I really do think that as we have come to understand, we are living in a bell jar. We are the mouse. right? We live on a planet that is constrained. We're in you know, floating through space. We're living on this bell jar. And at its heart, sustainability means the wise management of life's five essential elements. And what makes me more optimistic now than I was 10 years ago is that we know how to do this. We can get there. We can fix this. We can figure this out. We, it, it seems like it's too big, but it's actually not. If you think of it through this lens, it's really obvious that we can get there if we try. And I think that's the hopeful message that I'd like to leave uh, as I open it up for questions. Thank you. I don't know how long that was, but if we have time for questions. <laughs> Yes. Oh, I think they want you to use the mic. Thank you. Uh, hello. Hello. Hi, I'm Allison from Advancement. Hi, Allison. I had a question about the. I'm delighted to hear that sustainability is a is a truly achievable thing. But I was listening to Fresh Air, and they were talking about how the batteries mm -hmm. is all base. Uh, it's I think it's cobalt that all comes from one place, which is leading to basically human slavery and massive environmental degradation. Can we get to this possible future without also destroying 
That's a fantastic question, and uh, I actually just had an op-ed in the New York Times about this very topic, so it's like, thank you. Uh, we'll, I'll give you the $20 for asking that question later. Um, okay, so a couple things. Uh, first, at the, I'm going to address the, the COBOL issue directly, uh, or initially, and then I'm going to make a larger point. So it is true that cobalt mining, particularly in the Democratic Republic of Congo, is a horrible thing with horrible environmental consequences, uh, and that that needs to be taken very seriously, and we should definitely avoid that. I think that the focus specifically on that particular mining, without thinking about all of the horrible environmental consequences that go with oil spills and oil extraction and the exploitation that is in that world, is uh, like... I'm not saying I, I should choose one over the other. I'm just saying it's sort of a, it's, it's, it's a deliberate strategy on certain people's part to highlight that particular horror of mining as opposed to all of the other horrors of mining, which are also very real. With regards to cobalt, those batteries are already being phased out. So uh, Tesla Model 3 in this country no longer uses cobalt. <laughs> None of, the, none of the batteries in China use cobalt. Chevy Bolt next year will not use cobalt. Um, and so people are moving past that battery. And so the more general point I want to make on the EV front is that um, the technology, it's, it's like cell phones in 2005. Like it's changing so fast and getting so much better so fast. And people are keeping those concerns in mind. So when those report, like as soon as, first of all, everybody was worried about cobalt because it's hard to get. So they didn't want to be dependent on a rare element. But then once the news started to break about how horrific it was, that sort of pushed people even faster to just be like, let's just get rid of cobalt. So yes, we can. Um, but I would also say we also have to keep in mind that, and this is true for all of this transition stuff, the counterfactual is not everything is great. The biggest environmental injustice in the world is that the two billion poorest people on the planet who have done the least to cause the problem are going to be the worst affected by climate change. And so at the same time as thinking about the local problems of how we fix climate change, we also have to realize that if we do nothing and keep burning fossil fuels, that is actually a much, in my opinion, a much larger environmental injustice. That's not to say that, it, you know, that I should get to decide what is, but I think it's important that we keep that in mind. So I hope that answers the question. Al. Al already knows all this stuff, so I don't know what he's going to ask me. <laughs> so Stephen, um, first of all, I love the book. Thank you. Great read. Um, so my question has to do with the end of chapter one, great oxidation event. Mm -hmm. The earth is a frozen you know, ball of ice. How did it unfreeze? How did it unfreeze? <laughs> I, was, I became obsessed with that. <laughs> and all I could think of was a volcanic activity or yeah. changing orbit around the sun. Yeah, so I think the honest answer is we really don't know. Um, and so I have a colleague uh, at Cornell who is a much better geochemist than I am, and, and he said to me, you know, the great thing about writing about early Earth is we really don't know that much, so you can kind of just make it up. <laughs> <laughs> So, but I think the real answer is we don't know. So, so we know with absolute, as absolute certainty as you ever get in science that, that the Earth oxygenated at a very specific point. Uh, and I list some of the evidence in the book in terms of the transition from like no red rocks to red rocks, and that's the indication of free oxygen in the atmosphere or in the, in the, in the ocean. Um, but there's actually much stronger evidence from isotopes and other things, really from isotopes that was, I, couldn't, I didn't want to go into in the book. So we know that there was this rather abrupt transition to oxygenation. And we know um, mostly from models that that causes freezing because you don't have a lot of records of glaciation, like you don't have a lot of geologic record left from that time, um, and uh, especially on the continent, uh, uh, on continental rock, from continental rocks. So, how it gets unfrozen, I really don't know the answer to. Um, but I, I, there, are, there are plenty of speculations. I think the evidence is like, well, we know it did. But we also don't know whether it was a series of pulsed glaciations, whether the Earth was completely frozen or like mostly frozen. And we do know from modern times that you can go from a frozen state to an unfrozen state just by wobbling the tilt of the Earth's axis and changing its orbital parameters, right? Over the last two million years, we've had several glacial advances and retreats. You know, if you had been here 12,000 years ago, there would be almost half a mile of ice over this spot. And that change from half a mile of ice over 
Rhode Island, or what was Rhode Island, uh, uh, to, to now is simply a little bit of wobbling of the Earth's orbit. And so with the waxing and waning of solar activity uh, and changes in orbit, there's all sorts of reasons why you could have gone from a frozen to unfrozen state um, once you got into that frozen state. But which one it was and when and how many frozen states there were, there have been several other snowball Earths uh, in the past. Not, that was the first one we think we know about, but um, there were others after that. Um, the last glaciation was not a snowball Earth because you know if you went to even as far south, just south of New York City, there were no, no, no glaciers there. But um, yeah, sorry, that's not a great answer, but it's honest. <laughs> other questions? Yeah. So, <clears throat> believe it or not, I actually talk with my friends about some of this stuff. I and totally believe it. And <laughs> one, of, one of the arguments that I get a lot is um, that, you know, so we want to go towards more uh, electric powered things. Mm -hmm. And it's, there is no solid answer for it, whether it's wind or solar. Um, but for the foreseeable future, because we can't get past the nuclear problem, we're burning fossil fuels to generate electricity on a very taxed grid already. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is, how do I talk to somebody mm. about this problem where we're making very near future decisions as far as electrifying our, our transportation system, yet we don't have the other answers in place seemingly to support that? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Thank you for that question. Um, I have a couple thoughts. So the first thought is that we actually have quite a bit more of the answer than, than you might think. So even without adding nuclear to the grid, uh, renewables can play a much bigger role than they are right now especially as storage comes online. So the Vermont utility, for example, just decided that rather than upgrade their grid infrastructure as much, they were going to give out batteries to everyone in homes and help smooth power demand by, by essentially Tesla power walls or the equivalent in the basements. In terms of transportation, uh, even if you electrify uh, all of our vehicle fleet here in Rhode Island, uh, personal vehicle fleet, it's really only about a 10% increase in the amount of electricity demand and that can be spread out. It's really the home heating that's going to be a problem. Um, in, in winter, we're going to move from a summer peak when people are air conditioning to a winter peak when people are heating. But we already have the capacity to uh, deliver that summer peak. And so, for example, for Brown, um, if we electrify the whole campus with relatively efficient heat pumps, we'll be roughly even in our winter and summer demand. Um, like not very far different. And so we already have that capacity, or if we need more capacity, it's because we're building more buildings, not because. Um, and then in sort of more, more broad terms, what I would say is the biophysical reality is we have a very short amount of time to solve climate change. And the fact that we can't see 100% of the way to where we want to go should not stop us from getting going. I'm always surprised by the people who think who are so pro-American innovation and exceptionalism, except in this area where they say it's completely impossible and we shouldn't even try. It seems to me and the antithesis of what humans have been able to achieve, right? We thought we were all going to starve to death, and then we, we figured out how to fix nitrogen fertilizer, and now we feed 8 billion people, which nobody would have thought, and even in 1970, that we could feed 8 billion people. The hunger that's in the world right now is not because we don't produce enough food. It's because we don't distribute food well, right? and because of political and economic and structural inequalities, not because we can't produce enough food. But if you had asked someone in 1970, could we feed 8.5 billion people, everybody would have said no. Right? So I totally agree. We cannot run the grid on 100% renewables today, but we can run the grid on much more renewables than we are even now. And storage is coming online super fast. It's getting cheaper. Uh, the price of solar and wind is now cheaper than coal and natural gas in every market. Some markets, storage plus renewables is cheaper, right? Like we're getting there. And so I don't understand. We're not, we're not at a point where we're stressing the grid. Like, let's get to that point, <laughs> right? And then we will, I feel very confident that we can figure this out. This is, this is much easier than putting someone on the moon. I think that that's probably the best way of getting towards that, is that last model right there. We're not 
there yet, but by the time we get there, we can figure it out. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like what's changed for me in the last decade is that I can see 70% of the way to the climate answer. And a decade ago or 15 years ago, I couldn't. And you know, just a, on another hopeful note on this front, in, so there have been two major international climate agreements in the last 20 years, one in Copenhagen in 2009 and one in Paris in 2015. Pre-2009, climate scientists would have said we're on a trajectory to a four and a half degree warmer world, which is globally catastrophic and completely unimaginable planet. Four and a half degrees. Now we think we're on a 2.7 degree trajectory. Now that's still a really bad outcome, but that's a full two degrees we've shaved off in the last 20 years, right? That's incredible progress. And I think like what we don't, if we actually manage to emerge as a world-changing organism that chooses not to change the world, it will be the greatest achievement in human history. And I think that we can actually get there in this century. So, you know, to me, that's something to worth, it's, it's worth dying on that hill, right? Like, let's try. And if we fail, we fail. But like, who wants to tell their kids you didn't try, right? Like, it's just, it's an embarrassment. So that, you know, that's all. That's my take. Exactly, exactly. She hears about this a lot. She's really, really, really sick of it. Yeah. I think there's a question over there. Hi. So um, it's become obvious to me that uh, despite the science research and knowledge by many people like yourself that things have to change and that there are things that can be done, a lot of it isn't resonating uh, with many, many people and industries in the world we live in, mm -hmm. either because of economic benefit and gains or because people are not connecting the larger conceptual issues to their immediate life. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not connecting the dots and it's not real and they're mm -hmm. not recognizing what they could do. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, you know, do you see, um, in, based on your research and experience, do you see ways in which um, there could be a connection between uh, personal economic gain of industries, businesses, those that are profiting from things going the wrong, being done the wrong way now, to transitioning to things being done in the correct way that would benefit our planet and our survival, and also people who are not necessarily, or industries that are not necessarily altruistic for the greater good, transitioning to seeing that they would also benefit mm -hmm. and the outcome would be the greater good. It'd be nice if it was all about altruism. That's not gonna be and, all about and, it. And doing the right thing, that's yeah. right. Yeah. But, so I'm asking, you, you understand what I'm I totally do, it's a, great, it's a great question. Thank you. So I'm gonna make myself extraordinarily unpopular with this, with this answer. Uh, and I, uh, so I think that's already totally happening. The only, the only group for which that's really a problem business-wise is the fossil industry, right? But I'm gonna make myself unpopular with this because I'm gonna say that the person who has done the most in all of human history to help fix climate change is Elon Musk. He has driven the transition to electric cars single-handedly and you know, he's not doing it for altruism, uh, and he's made a lot of money doing it, and I'm not saying he's a good guy or anything like that, but like, on the numbers, on the, on the amount of CO2 kept out of the atmosphere relative to your life, like, who, who there's, there's no one else. And so, I think that capitalism, uh, many of my colleagues on the Brown faculty are very anti-capitalism. I, I feel like that's, that conversation is, uh, interesting academically, but in the next 20 years, we're going to live in a capitalist world, and that's how much time we have to dramatically reduce emissions. And so we can argue about whether there's a better form of society that we want, and we should all be advocating and fighting for a society that we think is better, whatever that means. But I would imagine that even in this room, there is not consensus about what better means. The atmosphere is giving us the consensus on how much CO2 it can take, and for the next 20 years, we're going to live in a capitalist world. So the solution has to come in the world that we live in, because if it requires everybody to agree, agree in the world on what good means, we're totally out of luck, right? Fortunately, electric cars are just better than gas cars, so that's a big win. Heat pumps are better than furnaces, that's a big win. Renewables are cheaper 
than oil and gas and coal. That's a big win. And they're going to, unlike gas cars, which are not going to get any cheaper, electric cars in 10 years are going to make our electric cars today look like junk. Nobody's going to want them. It's like, do you want your flip phone from, the, in to, from 2005? No. Solar and wind are going to be half as expensive again, right? And therefore way under oil and coal. And, you know, so I think that there's plenty of, there's plenty of reason to debate what society should be like, but I think even within the society we uh, have, I can see 70% of the way there. Where I can't see is in places where there's really bad, really weak governance. I can't, deforestation's gonna be really hard to stop. And that's a source of emissions I didn't talk about here. I, there's no real great answer for emissions from agriculture unless we all stop eating as much meat. But in fact, when people get wealthier, they tend to eat more meat. Um, so there, there, there are things that I don't, like we don't know, right? There's, but I don't think we need everybody to be good. <laughs> um, you know, nobody, I, I heard this from uh, a sustainability guy named Amory Lovins once, like, nobody cares what light bulb is up there. They just want light. If that light bulb is LED and uses 5% of the electricity of an incandescent and the light's the same, who cares, right? And we can do one better than that because the EV that you're going to get next is like 100 times better than your gas car. And it's going to be cheaper over, even to, it's going to be as cheap to buy up front and cheaper to own over the lifetime. So I think there's a lot of progress. I don't know all the way 100% of the way there, but I definitely think if we have to depend on good nature of human humans to do it, we're in big trouble. So let's find a way not to do that. Yeah. Question over there? No, I'm good, thanks. I'm going to go coffee so I can stay energized. Yeah. I think this is the perfect place for my next for my next question. On the slide where you talked about making your own house like net zero and getting an electric vehicle and stuff like that, you talked about how much less you're paying on gas now. But I was wondering how much money you put into your house mm, and question. stuff and how long it took to see a benefit. Because I feel like individual people want to, they're not going to make a change unless it's going to help them financially. And they want to know how yep. long. <laughs> right. So this is a great question, and I think this is a really important question. So right now, the transition that I made in my house or the transition that Brown is making to our campus is not affordable for everybody. But the top 1% of earners in the world are responsible for roughly half of the emissions, or you know, almost half. Right? And those people can definitely afford it. Brown can afford it. I can afford it. If, all, if everyone who could afford it did it, we'd be well on our way to driving the cost down on all of those technologies. So we're in a moment now. Like, my EV was more expensive than the non-EV. But by next year, that won't be true. And by the year after that, it'll be cheaper. It's already cheaper to own and operate. And life lifetime cost, the EV is cheaper. So how much did my house cost? My house cost in 2014, so things were cheaper then. But in 2014, it cost about $50,000, I would say, to do what I did to my house, or maybe a little bit more. But the house is way more comfortable than it was. It has air conditioning in every room where it had none before. Uh, and so the payback time was about 10 years. Also, I was able to get an uh, interest-free loan for the heating system transformation. With the Inflation Reduction Act, all of that has changed, because now there's huge incentives for the transition to heat pumps and for insulation and all of that stuff. So I wouldn't want to, but also inflation has driven up the cost of labor a lot. So I don't know what it would cost to do today. I will say that, so I live on the east side of Providence. I don't know any of my neighbors who haven't spent more than that renovating a bathroom or a kitchen. And all of them tell me that it's too expensive to do this, right? But because they need the marble tile or whatever. So yeah, it, like life is full of choices, right? Um, but people who own homes on the east side of Providence in general put that amount of money into their home at some point, right? Um, so I, I really hope and I think that um, if those of us who can afford to do it, do it, that will drive the cost down and everybody else will then, I mean, and that's what's happening with EVs. I hope it happens. I think home renovations are tricky. You really have to, the other thing I would say, if any of you would like advice on this, <laughs> um, pair it with something, a big thing you're doing already. So like in our case, we. I don't know if you saw how lousy the paint job was in the old version, but like we deliberately didn't paint because I wasn't sure I was going to get tenure. And also, <laughs> <laughs> um, but then we 
we were able then to say, okay, the paint job would have cost whatever, $15,000. If we pull the siding off and put on pre-painted siding, that will allow us to put a whole bunch of insulation underneath. And the siding is guaranteed for 30 years, which is roughly two paint jobs. So then we could start to say, you know, but again, these are privileged, like these are not living month to month kind of decisions. So there are real challenges, for example, in homes with renters. Because if you're renting, you pay the utility bill, but you have no ability to upgrade the heating system. And if you're the landlord, you don't pay the utility bill, so why would you upgrade the heating system? So there's, we're having conversations, for example, as we talk about what should Rhode Island do with its gas network. Like, should there be a law or should there be incentives for landlords of renters to pay the incremental difference between replacing the furnace with another gas furnace versus transitioning to heat pumps? And, you know, like, there are ways to structure, to structure those things. So it, it's not a... I'm not saying this is simple, right? But I'm saying it's doable. And, the, and, and I think you know, the Inflation Reduction Act and the infrastructure bill are the two biggest pieces of climate legislation ever passed, even though they didn't call either one of them a climate bill. Um, and that's going to help, right? It's $37 billion a year for 10 years. It's a lot of money. It's not nearly as much as we spend every week on the military, but it's still a lot of money. So you know, it's coming. But it's a great question. Yeah? either we can just just start by replacing a burned out bulb with an LED bulb you know every little tiny bit will help yeah actually I would if I could just jump in on that before in the in the uh, the neck if for, for all of you homeowners out there when your AC goes when your compressor goes replace it with something that can provide heat in the winter as well as cooling in the summer and if you're worried about not having enough heat keep your furnace right but just run the heat pump as much as you can. And if there are times when it gets too cold and you want to turn on your furnace, go ahead and do it. But that will reduce your emissions dramatically. And then the next time you have an opportunity to add insulation, add that, and then you won't need the furnace anymore. So you don't have to jump uh, uh, into the deep end. You can dip a toe if you have air conditioning, replace it with one that will provide heat even in cold weather, and use that. That's much more efficient. Keep the furnace if you need it. Security blanket, it's all good, right? And then you'll see whether you can, you know, I, I, and also one last thing on the house part. Like, we live a lot of time in our houses, and they're not very comfortable. And if you have heat pumps and, and a decently insulated house, it's super comfortable, which is, like, kind of nice for the place that you spend most of your time. And I think it would be a mistake to discount that. Again, if you're living month to month, right, that's not, that's not first and for foremost, nor should it be. But anyway. You're getting a good workout today. How might you begin to argue with homeowners associations or historic preservation societies who are halting <laughs> the installation of solar panels because they alter the characteristics of a historic neighborhood? Well, first I would call Al Dahlberg <laughs> because he, know, he knows how to talk to neighbors about historic preservation better than anybody. Um, you know... Boy, <laughs> I think homeowners associations and uh, historic preservation are two different groups. Um, but honestly, I haven't really cracked either nut super well. Um, I think a lot, of, a lot of this comes actually from, not on the historic preservation side, but a lot of this comes on the building code side also. Like, you could just require solar panels to go on new buildings. You could just require there be no new gas hookups, right? You could just require, like, you could just, I mean, the way that we've seen efficiency improvements is often by just lowering the floor and in industry response. Uh, these are called min min minimum energy performance standards. Um, and so I think for the new construction, like, I think a really good, and, and then the price is just getting cheaper. So for a lot of this, it doesn't matter. So the new buildings down at Trader Joe's, you know, those don't have furnaces. And the reason they don't have furnaces is because it's cheaper to build them without furnaces. My in-laws live over in Kettle Point, which is in East Providence. They moved into one of the very first condos. It has a furnace. The one that was finished across the street, which was one of the last, has heat pumps because it's cheaper. So, you know, it's coming. Now, the people who don't want solar panels because of the historic houses, I, I'm being recorded here. <laughs> um, I, I will just point out, I mean, I will just point out that if Antarctica melts and Greenland melts, water will be at the middle of the silai. So that's not going to happen in this century. But if you're talking about historic preservation, 
you know, like, let's get real here, you know, but, you know, whatever. I don't want to get too off color. Yeah. <laughs> He is, he is, yeah, yeah. It feels like maybe the right pause to thank Stephen. All right, Not thanks everybody. Thank you. Your amazing book and your whirlwind tour through it, so if you haven't read it, do go read it. Yeah, and now you have this the really stimulating and motivating conversation we just had. Great. Thank you again, Stephen. Thanks, everybody. That was super fun.